Okay, so why do airlines keep stopping these from entering flights? My spray, perfume, lotion and toothpaste are all banned. Why are they banned? Because you are telling me we managed to put a man on the moon, we built cars that run on batteries, we edited the genetic sequence of plants to produce food to feed billions of people. But when I take my spray perfume along with me onto the plane, suddenly the plane will crash. So I have to leave all my lovely stuff behind before getting into the plane. And to make matters worse, I have to put my phone on airplane mode and be cut out from the rest of the world when the plane is about to take flight. I got tired of not understanding the rules and so I decided to research it. Knowing that the aviation industry is more than a hundred years old, I knew taking up this task was going to be one of the most difficult tasks I have taken this year. I spent the next 21 days straight frantically digging through the internet, trying to investigate and understand why these rules still exist today. What I found is a story that begins in the 1920s with the first ever commercial flight, the Lawson L2 operated by the Lawson Airline Company. Before the loss in L2 took flight with its first 20 passengers, many did not think it was possible to commercialize air travel having up to 20 people fly together in the same aircraft. After the loss in L2 proved it was possible, many other commercial airlines started springing up. KLM of Netherlands, the Countess in Australia, the Czech Airlines and Colombia's Avianca Airlines among many others. But these were still early days in air travel. The flights were very expensive and only the rich could afford it. And the flights were not as perfect as they are today. The planes had to land frequently to refuel and fly at lower altitudes. The cabins were not pressurized, making flights very noisy, cold and expensive. The flights were mostly turbulent and passengers often experienced air sickness every time they were on flight. Many airlines had to hire nurses to reduce anxiety and to tend to affected patients on the flights. Those were very chaotic times. So by the end of the 1940s, aviation was booming. Investments began pouring into aviation and researchers began finding ways of making flights easier. They found out that the pressure difference within the cabin versus the surrounding environment of the plane played a critical role in easier flying conditions like noise and the breathing problems of passengers. The Boeing 307s began pressurizing their aircraft and air travel began feeling easier for passengers. As this continued, more airlines sprang up, more advertisements ran on mainstream media, travel costs began to drop and more people entertained the idea of air travel. Now, what that did was to open the doors to all types of people to be on board the same plane at the same time. Safety concerns began to rise and regulatory bodies began to step in. However, the ban of flying with fluids did not begin until 2006 when a terrorist plot to cause an explosion on an airplane while in flight was intercepted in the UK. Two men flying into the UK from Pakistan had plotted to set off a chemical bomb using hydrogen peroxide. The attackers were intercepted at the UK airport and detained. They were let go based on lack of conclusive incriminating evidence. The security agencies at the airport confirmed this again when the same attack was intercepted months later on a flight scheduled from the UK to the US. They had poured the chemicals into regular soda containers and planned to mix them up in the plane with acetone peroxide and other chemicals to cause the explosion. Right from then on, an immediate ban on flying with liquids was enforced at the airport. The ban did not make sense. People still needed those liquids while in flight. And so to solve this problem, extensive research into what volume of liquids would be the least risky while carried onto the flight had commenced. It was decided that 3.4 ounces or 100 milliliters of any liquid was the least risky to bring on board an aircraft. Although many also thought terrorists could just bring in separate bottles and mix them up on the airplane, it was just not feasible to safely carry out such a plot on a plane without getting noticed. To ensure there was no misinterpretation or misunderstanding of the rules, they came up with a formula that said gels, liquids, paste and creams had to fit into a container 3.4 ounces or less. And each of these containers must fit into one ziplock bag. And each traveler gets to carry only one ziplock bag. 
they term this the 311 rule. And we can all agree that to every law, there is an exception. Medications like insulin and prescription drugs are allowed in reasonable quantities on the plane and do not have to fit the quarter size Ziploc bags. Baby formula, breast milk, and baby food are allowed in slightly large amounts. So many other countries, looking up to the example of the US and the EU, started enforcing the same restrictions. And before long, the entire world was enforcing it. But there was more to the restrictions than the terrorist attacks. The general safety of passengers and the cabin crew was the overarching priority here. Hence, things like sharp objects, tasers, batteries, and sporting items like golf clubs, baseball bats, and hockey sticks were all banned from flights. A little caveat here. These items were not completely banned from flights. You were just not allowed to carry them with you in your carry-on bags onto the plane. You can add them to your checked-in bag and get them when you arrive at your destination. The goal is to make sure you do not have access to it on the plane. Now, I know none of my subscribers are terrorists or anything close to that. And if you are not a subscriber yet, kindly hit the subscribe button and hit the like button. I would really appreciate that. But assuming you were a terrorist and you were planning to set up a bomb in the airplane, the first line of protection of the airline is to make sure you are separated from your bomb, ammunition, or weapon of mass destruction. That way you cannot carry out your plan to end the war. When you pay close attention, you will see this plan masterfully executed from when you buy your flight tickets to when you arrive at the airport for your flight and when you get to your destination. So let's assume you are flying from Maryland to New York. You bought your ticket, packed your luggage and drove to the airport. When entering the airport, your first stop would be the bag check-in and ticket printer. If you haven't checked in online, you can check in and print your ticket. You can also check in your large bag if you have not at this point. Now any item that is not supposed to go into your carry-on bag must be put into the checked in bag and checked in. Once you check in, you can now head to TSA pre-check. At this point, anything that violates the 311 rule is removed and discarded. Now this is usually a sad and frustrating situation, but that's the rule. Once you go through, you head to the assigned gate where your plane will await the scheduled time for your flight. You go through the gate and then you enter through the tunnel into your plane. The entire setup is made intentionally to make sure you don't bring these unwanted items with you into the plane. Now there's an important thing to note here. Remember you are allowed only 3.4 ounces of liquid onto the plane. Once you pass through TSA PreCheck, you are allowed to buy the largest Coke bottle and carry it onto the plane. And if you forgot to buy it from the retail stores before getting on board, you can still buy it on the plane. They have enough on the plane to sell to everyone. This seems like a genius business plan by the retail stores at the airport. First, seize their 12 ounces of canned Coke and then sell them a 2 liter bottle Coke which equates to a behemoth 67 ounces and at a price which is double or triple that which is sold outside the airport. This seems like a complete ripoff. But then again, this seems to be the only way to prevent terrorist attacks like the 2006 attempted episode. After going through the series of defenses at the airport, the terrorists will have no way to cause an explosion. No retail store at the airport will sell anything with malicious material to anyone. This way, the system always stays clean and everyone is safe. The good news is, technology is advancing. Security checkpoints are getting a boost in sensing technologies via artificial intelligence and machine learning. More robust scanners like CT scanners are being introduced in many airports in the EU and here in the US. The CT scanners provide detailed images of items in bags and can decipher between gels, liquids, and solids, including the type of liquid. Using artificial intelligence, automatic threat detection algorithms used at the airport security checkpoints can automatically detect dangerous items, including liquids, without the need for manual checking by security staff. These systems continually improve their accuracy through machine learning as they keep using them. Companies like Agilent Technologies and Lidos are already investing Investing in LEDs, liquid explosive detection systems. The future is exciting. While researching this topic, I came across a 2024 news item that read TSA wants liquid restrictions will remain in effect until 2040. Quoting the words of a TSA spokesperson in this news item, 
TSA is still deploying CT units that are capable of screening large sizes of liquids. However, the agency will not be able to change the current 311 liquid rule for some time to come because there are about 2,000 screening lanes in about 430 airports. We anticipate that it may not be until 2040 that we have CT units fully deployed across the nation and have the capability of changing the requirement across the system. So in the meantime, we have to deal with this situation as CT scanners rollout happens. Okay, so now we've passed the security checkpoint and we are now on the plane and we are getting ready to take off. Then all of a sudden we hear the announcement that says we will turn on airplane mode. Ladies and gentlemen, we are ready for departure. Please be seated and fasten your seatbelts. Please turn into flight mode, all mobile phones and electronic devices. If this feature is not available on your device, please turn it off for the entire flight. So I turn off everything I'm doing and put the phone on airplane mode. I know this is very frustrating for a lot of people just like me. So even though it might be convenient for me to end the video here, I decided to spend two extra days researching into this whole airplane mode conundrum. My research led to 1961 when the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration found that some portable FM radios could interfere with plane navigation systems since they used neighboring radio bands. They proceeded to ban using personal electronic gadgets on flights. Even though this rule was in place, airlines could test any interference device and overrule the FAA ban to allow it on board. The FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, had to get involved because when it comes to cell phones, you begin to operate in their jurisdiction. They noted that while on the ground, a mobile phone could only contact a few towers at a time because of the tall buildings, mountains and trees obstructing them. However, in the air, these obstructions are non-existent. One cell phone could reach several cell towers. Now having 150 to 200 cell phones reaching all these cell towers at the same time will operate like a radio jammer, interfering with the plane's own communication systems and those of people on the ground. So the FCC, in agreement with the FAA, unanimously banned the use of cell phones on airplanes in 1991. After the ban, further research came out showing that cell phones could not jam radio signals from the ground. The thick metal body of the airplane itself shielded the signals from going out of the plane. The windows were the only way signals could go out of the plane. And flying 30,000 feet above the ground, it wasn't even possible that these signals could interfere with radio communication towers from the ground. It turned out that most important periods for enforcing airplane mode is during takeoff and landing. The more we adhere to the rules, the lower the signals and the safer our flights will become. The safety of air travels continues to improve. The data shows massive decline in air travel incidents and drastic reduction in fatalities and severity of casualties. Although this data is based on research conducted in the United States, the situation is similar in many countries across the world. We owe the safety we enjoy as we ply the highways of the air to the meticulous care that is taken to ensure everything is controlled and that you can travel the world and feel safe while doing so. Alright, so there we have it. Regardless of the airplane mode rule or the inconvenience of the liquid restrictions, we know it's for our safety. Remember, these rules were not in place until bad actors began flying with us on the same plane. As technology develops, flights keep getting better and better. Just for the sake of safety and your own peace of mind at TSA, let's adhere to these rules and enjoy our flights. Thank you for watching. Remember to subscribe and like this video. Until I come your way with another interesting one, check out this video.